Well, make yourselves at home. Uh, so the, I'm Maureen McGuigan, Deputy Director of Arts and Culture for Lackawanna County. This, uh, I've been there 10 years, 10th breakfast, my 10th year. So um, very grateful uh, to work for this great county with great commissioners who support the arts. Um, and what a great problem to have. We apologize we ran out of forks, but uh, we're artists. And just like that famous Magritte painting, this is not a pipe. No, it's a, and this is not a fork, it's a spoon, but it works, right? And that's the great thing about art. Um, beyond just art being, I think, the soul of humanity, to get a little deep, it, it's also, it solves problems, it makes our lives better, it educates us, it causes us to critically think. It takes situations that might seem bad at first and, turn, and turns them into something magical and interesting. So I just use our running out of forks example as that. But uh, so we're so thrilled to have you here today for our 10th um, breakfast. I can't believe it. Uh, this started back in 2008 with the concept of We've all, you know, we've all probably been to a lot of breakfasts and lunches, and we always get something out of them, but we wanted the arts breakfast to be something a little different to celebrate what we do. So the idea of waking up with music, with these beautiful um, design tables, with these really inspirational speakers. So that was kind of the heart of the, uh, the event. And I really have to thank our event planning committee. I'm going to start with them. We have an arts, um, culture, and, advi and education advisory council who works all year um, helping us with programs and policies. And the event planning committee has uh, really developed these over the years. So I would like to thank uh, Megan Passamato, Tenye Verkaitis, um, Bob Savakinis is here, Nada Gilmartin who greeted you at the door, Fran Pantuso is here, how oh, good, we have a lot, Cole Hastings is here, um, and uh, Alicia Grega is not here, um, but all of these people work very hard and um, I'd like to thank Jessica Mioni, who's on our ACE Council, that also designed our flyer. So every year we have a rigorous process. We sit and we um, have a short list and then we decide on the speaker. So let's just give them a round of applause for, uh, for their hard work. Um, I did mention that we, we woke up to the sounds of the Justin Padro trio. Weren't they great? You can, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Um, you definitely look for them on Facebook. They've been playing at places like Jack's Draft House and The Bog and some other places around town. So if you enjoyed them, please support our local artists. I have to support um, my wonderful staff, Chris Calvi, our program manager. And of course, he just, oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Wayne Hiller from the Trolley Museum and the staff who worked to make this breakfast possible. Our catering was by Posh. We're always thrilled to have Electric City Television here because a lot of people wanted to come but maybe can't, and then they get to watch it on our public access and YouTube channel. So if you enjoy Matt's presentation, you can also watch it again on either on Channel 19. Um, um, I do want, um, before I bring up um, Commissioner O'Malley, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, oh, I do want to, you know, I think it's worth it. I do want to recognize all the people who decorated the tables because it's a lot of work and aren't they beautiful? So I'm just going to read their names. Um, we have tables by Verver 2 Art Studio, the Everhart Museum, the Dunmore Cemetery Tour, uh, the Walk Unafraid Project by Tenye, um, Gretchen Kohut, who's an artist, Lindsay George, another artist, right here, um, Electric City Trolley Museum, um, and yeah, that's, that's and Cal, of course, Creative and uh, Performing Arts Academy is, uh, also did a table for us, so thank you. We hope you enjoyed them. Yeah. Oh, and I can't, I would neglect, aren't the bags beautiful this year? So th these are our swag bags. So there is a lot of great stuff in there, um, a lot of what you are all doing, so we encourage you to look through them, but um, we had Valley View and West Grant High School design them this year, and I just, they're just like little works of art, so I, I just think they came out really beautiful. So we want to thank those art teachers. Because that's what it is, right? It's everybody. It's the art teachers, it's the artists, the musicians, the, the arts administrators, the organizations, the state arts councils. That's what it takes to, to build a community. So I want to thank all of you, because I know you are all doing things in the arts to make our community great. So I want to bring up Commissioner O'Malley now, who's going to say a few words about Lackawanna County and the arts and his personal vision. And we're he's very dedicated to supporting the arts and making Lackawanna County a great place to live. Ladies and gentlemen, Maureen McGuigan. Yeah. 
and her faithful assistant, Chris Calvi, who was the best. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is about quality of life. Our arts culture department is about making our community better. We have so many opportunities. We have so many grant streams, so many options for our artists, theater, ballet, everything. Our community is so surrounded. It's intertwined in everything that we do daily. And as a commissioner, I promise to make sure that we will always make sure this is in our quality of life. Because without it, we don't have a quality of life in Lackawanna County. We have such great opportunities, especially recent. We have Hunt Slonem here. Think about this. World-renowned artist here who bought the Woolworths Mansion, another piece of art that was probably on the edge of being torn down. The place is redone over to its former self. It's an amazing home for him, one of his homes. The Watrous Armory, something that Lackawanna County government actually looked at. We were thinking about trying to buy it. The roof alone probably was going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars, let alone to redo the inside of the building. It's an art gallery for his art, his antiques. I mean, this is who he is. And then he turns around and he gives artwork to the Everhart Museum. I think our area can draw great people. There's already great people here, but we can draw some great people in this area. There's a lot of great artists from outside this community that don't know what a jewel Lackawanna County is. But I'd just like to thank all of you and wish everyone a very happy and safe Columbus Day weekend. And Mari McGuigan, great job as usual. You're the very best and happy art day. Bye. And I just got a note, I forgot to mention, I'm really excited actually about this table. Laurel Roditsky is a local poet, so we, you know, the literary arts are just as important. So check out her Poets Toolkit table. So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that one. And I just kind of want to highlight the Verver 2 table because it ties in with a, we have an arts engaged task force at the county that works to utilize arts for social change. It's made up of different departments. I'm staring at George Kelly. Economic development, um, drug and alcohol, mental health, senior services. So it's, it's a great group and we work to, to bring the arts to lots of different people and solve social challenges. And this year we're launching a transformation project. So Verver 2 and Moscow Clayworks are creating these butterflies um, that we will be hanging we hung some at the arts festival but we're going to do it all year our goal is 5,000 butterflies so I mentioned that if you're a group or if you have some people that would like to be part of that and paint them we're happy to get you some of those butterflies so you can put your name on a list if you want to see me afterwards so I just wanted to kind of mention that uh, so I'm going to bring up our wonderful speaker. We're really excited about this. Uh, it kind of, it's, it's a really fitting year. Like I said, every year we've brought in speakers from all across the country. We've had a dance company and a landscape architect last year from Maine. But this year we thought we, we really wanted to celebrate Pennsylvania. And it was really fitting because we just had the Governor's Awards for the Arts here, which was beautiful. Thank you to all who worked at Liz, see Leslie Collins from Scranton Tomorrow worked very hard on that and Liz. So that was a beautiful event. And we also participated in their strategic plan. Uh, the, the PCA is doing a uh, they're visiting 13 communities and they're putting together a strategic plan, which I'm, I'm sure Matt will talk about. So I thought it was really fitting um, that, and I have to say, uh, Matthew was, we always have a short list, but it was unanimous. We didn't even argue over you. It was like, yes, let's bring him in. <laughs> <'Cause no. laughs> and I have to say, he is a delightful person. One of my favorite things is I get to take the speakers out to dinner and get to know them a little better. And we just had the best time last night. Um, really interesting journey to his, um, he's been six years now at the Pennsylvania Council of the Art and I'm sure he's going to share some of those stories, but rich arts background, was at the Berks Arts Council, um, ran the Greater Reading Film Festi Festival and Literary um, Festival. So I'm really interested to hear what he has to say about his personal journey and the state of the arts in PA. So welcome, Matthew. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I want to cover a few things before I start. Um, I have a very unique style. Um, I sometimes go very fast. Um, is anybody familiar with Jane Golden, uh, the mural arts program in Philadelphia? Has anybody heard her speak? OK, she will do a 45-minute presentation in 15 minutes. It is absolutely incredible, and I love it. 
So a few things, as I was writing this speech while sitting at the table here, <laughs> and I was asking people what we should talk about, I looked at the program and I read my bio and I thought, wow, this is a really interesting person. I cannot wait to hear him speak. <laughs> I did not even realize I did some of this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I do want to ask, um, first off, does anybody know what the, turn up, there we go. Does anybody know what the only fruit is that has its seeds on the outside? Strawberries, very good. And does anybody know why the Hudson River is not a river? <laughs> good. It's a. That's true. It's also it's a tidal estuary. It's actually a river when it starts off, but when it gets down to the Hudson Bay, it mixes. So. I just wanted to start with those two facts. So if you leave today, you can at least said, say you learned that, and then none of the other stuff will really matter for you. <laughs> so um, by a raise of hands, I want to see, and you can do multiple categories. How many artists do we have here today? Excellent. How many people from arts organizations, admin, work at arts organizations? Excellent. How many people that enjoy the arts? Okay, making sure you raise your hand because you might be in the wrong meeting. <laughs> so I want to do, um, talk, uh, first I want to start off with a few thank yous. Um, I want to thank uh, Cole and Maureen for bringing me here. Um, also I want to let you know they are the people that you can blame if this presentation does not go off the way that you had hoped it for. Um, I was trying to decide what to really talk about, and I thought about talking about Scranton and what makes Scranton great. But then I thought, I'm talking to a group of people from Scranton about what makes their city great. Someone from the outside, you already know that. So then I decided to talk about something that I know more about, and that's just me. <laughs> so, um, I was born at a very early age. <laughs> um, blah, 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 blah. All those interesting facts that are really only interesting when someone becomes famous. So, I will skip over that. And I just want to talk about my influences and how I started in the arts. Um, one of the first ones, does anybody know who this is? And I feel sorry for people over here who can't see it. Does anybody know who this artist is? Keith Haring, yes. So Keith Haring um, grew up in Kutztown. My father is a minister, uh, retired. Not really retired. He retired 10 years ago, and he was actually retired for about nine months until he got a another interim, interim preaching position, which he's been at for 10 years. They just stopped looking for a new pastor. But Keith was a member of our church. So his family is still there, uh, the Herrings, um, and he was a huge influence uh, on me growing up. Um, he was that artist that went off to New York and actually made it. Um, I love telling people about the fact that I have a, um, a jean jacket which he did the design on the back. It's in a closet at my parents. I really need to find it. I know it's still there. Um, I have a few bulletins, which he had sketched on. Um, but he just showed me in the arts that it doesn't, you know, you can be formally trained, but it's what's in your heart that moves, moves you. Um, and we have a nativity scene that he painted for us. And it's actually, this is a copy that was made uh, for us by the Reading Museum when they borrowed ours. Um, I tried to take a picture of the one, the actual one that's in our sanctuary, but it's bolted to the side of the building and uh, there's a glare on it. So I took a copy, a, a photo of the copy. Um, he was a huge influence in my early life. And also my great uncle was a painter. Um, Emilio Sirio, he's from Newark, New Jersey. That's Newark, New Jersey, not to be confused with Newark, Delaware. I want to make sure that people know the difference. Um, he lived in the Ironbound section of Newark. He had a uh, house, which I'll show you, which was actually a renovated church. And one morning, 
I, it was a Saturday morning, and this just shows how little of a life I had as a child. I was watching a PBS show on art, and uh, Vincent Price was giving a tour of his gallery. And he did not talk about my, un my great uncle, but over his shoulder, I saw a painting which I recognized. And I'm like, I know that painting. And he had one of my great uncle's paintings uh, in his gallery. And that was just phenomenal for me. And I actually told him, he goes, yeah, I know, that was one of my lesser paintings. I just, you know, I don't know how much he got it for, but it probably wasn't much. He's a very modest man. Um, but he taught me a lot about art. I used to spend a lot of time in his studio. Um, his studio was a renovated church, as I said in the Ironbound section. He used to give tours. Uh, it's on the uh, historic, um, historic buildings of Newark, New Jersey. Um, and he would give tours. And it was very unique. Uh, there was, he had this beautiful carpet. Uh, and it started to get very, this rug, and it started to get very worn. So what do you do as an artist when you're trying to replace a huge carpet? You paint it onto the floor. So he used to always say it was very difficult to, you know, sweep dust underneath it. But he had this beautiful carpet painted onto the, the floor of his studio. And he, they would give tours. And people would be standing in the middle of the room looking at the, the beautiful church, and then he would draw their attention to the carpet, and they'd immediately walk off of it. They'd been standing on it for about five, 10 minutes, but then they would immediately walk off of it. He's a very unique um, uh, man. He, he always liked, people would bring gifts, and even if he had no interest in them whatsoever, he would still save them. He hated rocking chairs. And someone, I don't know if they knew he did not like rocking chairs, but they decided to get him a rocking chair. He sanded the, the bottom of it so that it would not rock. <laughs> and you would sit in it, and it would just stay. Um, he also was very good friends with Betty Davis. Um, he would drive her back and forth to her house in Maine. Um, I actually have a photo of her standing by his car which I was my first car. It never really went anywhere, but I had it, and there were cigarette butts in this ashtray with red lipstick, which I don't know if they were hers, but <laughs> he went to her, the, uh, her auction after she passed away, and he actually bought a painting that he had done for her for, I think, about four times the amount that she paid him for it. Um, but it's like memories of that, of being um, around... Uh, that culture growing up, uh, meeting people uh, in his life. Um, I still remember one, mor uh, one morning that I was visiting there, and he was, he was talking with this very nice, very nice woman, and the doorbell rang, and she says, oh, that's my, my, um, my nephew to pick me up. And I said, oh, I'll get it. And I opened the door, and there's Joe Pesci standing there, and um, I didn't know, I just stood there and stared at him, and he's like, can I, can I come in? And I'm like, sure, and it, that was her nephew, and he was stopping by to pick her up. So the people that I met there were, were phenomenal. Um, and the other thing that I really liked about his place was shrunken heads. <laughs> he made these little shrunken heads that he would have around his studio, and it was in great contrast to all the beautiful art. And people would, one of the reasons why he stopped doing the tours is because things started going missing. And most of these disappeared, but we still had a few of them. So he was a great influence in my life. Um, what really took me on the journey of loving art was at one of his parties, um, I spoke with, I, I heard the story, and it was about this gentleman. Does anybody know who this is? So, um, Han van Meegren, so he was an art, Dutch art dealer in the uh, World War II, beginning of World War II, and he sold a lot of van Meers. And there were a lot of unknown masterpieces, and they, they were phenomenal. And a lot of the Dutch art collectors were buying these up before World War II because they did not want the art to fall into the Nazi hands. So after the war ended, though, there was a problem with that. 
Um, he was identified as a collaborator. Um, he was um, sentenced for treason. Um, but one of his paintings was purchased by um, Hermann Goring, and he considered it one of his most prized possessions was this painting. Um, but after the war, he was arrested. Um, it was considered treason. He was going to be sentenced to death. So he did the only thing that he could do, and that was admit that they were fakes, that he forged them. He was a forger. So he got the fame that he wanted, but not for the reason that he wanted. Um, so here's where it actually gets interesting. I know, the whole thing, the story, but it gets interesting that he was put on trial. Uh, he admitted it, um, that they were fakes. Um, but he said, they didn't believe him. They said, no, that's not possible. And he said, no, I can prove it. It's like, all I need is canvas, paint, six weeks, a lot of alcohol, and a lot of morphine. Because that's how he rolls. I listen to jazz music when I paint. He had other ways of doing it. So after six weeks, he produced a perfect Vermeer. So they said, okay, we're going to put you in prison for only a year. And he was fine with that. Um, whoops. Let's scroll down. So he was fine with that. Unfortunately, he passed away um, before he could actually serve his sentence. But the part that I find the most interesting is when um, Goring, who was awaiting execution in Nuremberg, was told that his prized possession was a fake, um, this person who any rational individual would agree is one of the most despicable people in history, it's told that he had the look as if he suddenly realized that there was evil in this world because somebody sold him a fake painting. And that moment of taking history and putting it with art had gotten me hooked. And from that point on, I knew I wanted to study art. I wanted to be in the art world. Um, I just loved everything to do with it, just that mixture of history, because that is also one of my uh, big passions. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got to the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. Um, I was very much involved in art in high school. Um, from there, I went to Kutztown University. Are there any Kutztown grads here? I knew there were some. Excellent. Um, I started out as a fine arts major. Um, in my second year, I think they did a spot inspection of my room and found out I did not have a beret or any black turtlenecks. <laughs> and I switched to communication design. Um, I still kept a lot of my friends from fine arts. I don't know. I have a very, a very um, divided mind when everything has to be in order and I get creative, but I really like the, the layout of graphic design. So I switched to that. So I went to school for graphic design for a while. Um, I then got a job at a local newspaper, a weekly newspaper, doing designing ad work. Um, I did that for some time until I found out that the people that were selling the ads made a whole lot more money than I did designing them. So I said, hey, can I try selling advertising? Kind of a people person, people like me. So that's what I did. So I went on and started selling advertising. And part of my beat was the Goggle Works. Has anybody been to the Goggle Works in Reading? It's the Community Arts Center. Um, and the Berks Arts Council was located there. Now, I'd been volunteering for a number of years with Berks Arts Council at the Berks Jazz Fest. Um, and uh, my father was on the board at one point. And I knew the, the staff very well. And the program manager stopped me in the hallway and told me that she was leaving. Um, it had been a running joke because they had problems keeping program managers around. So I went into the executive director's office and started to make fun of her for not being able to keep staff around, and I left with the job. <laughs> so I still think I hold the record of being there for six years, and I think that might be the longest that a program manager stayed in that position. Um, so I started out, that was my first start in the, the arts, in an arts organization. So I was with um, the Berks Arts Council for about six or seven years. Um, I then, our executive director decided to retire. Uh, 
Um, and I beat her out the door by two weeks because I left to go to work for Habitat for Humanity. Um, I did development work for Habitat for Humanity for about two years, both in Reading and in um, Lancaster. And it was when I was in Lancaster that I got a call from the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. Now, I'd worked with the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts while I was at the Berks Arts Council um, doing uh, grant work, uh, pretty much what I do now, overseeing it. So I worked with them, and I got hired from there. And I've been with them for about six years now. So I brought my fundraising background, my love of the arts, uh, all that to the state. And I've learned so much more since I have been at the Berks Arts Council. So I do want to go into a little bit about what we are, who we are, what we do. Um, for those who might not be familiar with the Berks Arts Council, and I'll explain why I'm talking about that in a little bit. So our mission, uh, the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts, is to foster the excellence, diversity, and vitality of the arts in Pennsylvania, and to broaden the availability and appreciation of, of those arts uh, throughout the state. I will come back to that statement at the end when we talk about our strategic plan. Um, our history, we started in 1966. We just celebrated our uh, 50th anniversary. Um, Governor Scranton signed a bill um, establishing us. It actually started um, when the NEA started. Uh, they were d giving out money to states, and they said you had to have a state arts agency to receive federal funding, so surprise, surprise, suddenly all of the states decided to have state arts agencies. So we started ours shortly after that. Uh, the funding for the PCA comes from the citizens. It's uh, through your taxes. Uh, we take that money and we funnel it back into the community uh, through grants and other programs that we do. Um, this is a look at our history of funding for the last 50 years. Now, you will see that uh, we started off very small. Um, we got up to about 16, 16, almost 16 million. There's a little triangle there that's shaded. That was when halfway through the year, they decided to cut our budget a little bit, and we actually had to give money back. Um, and then there was the huge drop, and we consider that the dark years. Um, I had just left the Berks Arts Council, or I was right, I think I might, it might have been right when I was leaving the, the Berks Arts Council uh, that that happened. Um, we had, actually they were trying to eliminate the arts uh, at one point. We were having rallies. We actually had the record of having the largest rally uh, in the rotunda was for the arts in 2009. Uh, people, st people still talk about it. We had the place packed. Um, it was phenomenal. Um, and then we had level funding for a number of years. Um, about eight years we had level funding. Uh, and then in the last year of uh, Governor Corbett, he proposed a $400,000 increase to the arts. And that was great. We love that. Um, then Governor Wolf in his first year proposed a $2 million increase to our budget, of which we received a million dollars. So that was phenomenal for the arts. We were very thankful for that. Um, and he has been a great supporter of the arts since then. Um, our, um, the Council of the Arts is overseen by a council of members. Uh, 19 members, 15 of them are members at large from the community. Uh, four of them are from the uh, legislature um, from both parties. Uh, we, had, we just had a retreat this past week to talk about our strategic plan, which I will talk about. Um, we have a phenomenal council. They're very engaged. Um, you can, on our website, almost all this information is available on our website. Please take a moment uh, this week, take a look at it, see who the council members are for your area, um, ones that you know and especially your legislators, let them know about how important the arts are for you. And we have a wonderful staff. This was actually taken here in Scranton at our Governor's Awards. Almost everybody was there for it. Um, this is a, a photo with the governor and his wife. And I'd also like to talk about what we do. So one of the big things that we do is funding. So we do funding through, um, 
We do about 1,200 grants a year. Uh, those are direct grants. We consider it, uh, it's called responsive funding. And responsive funding is when organizations or individuals apply directly to us for funding. Uh, we have, not non-responsive funding, but we have funding that is for, also that we give out to um, arts organizations that act as partners for us or for um, things like um, conferences, uh, development work as well. But we give about 12,000 or 1,200 grants out for uh, organizations that apply through us or through one of our partners. Uh, it's $9.6 million that's distributed through the state. In Lackawanna County, uh, we do about $156,000 a year in responsive funding. Now, the thing that makes that interesting is that is about 2.3% of our responsive funding for the state goes into Lackawanna County. And Lackawanna County makes up about 1.6% of the population. So that is phenomenal. Um, I actually looked that up. I wanted to make sure that I had that right. Because sometimes when I do these speeches, I go to use that, that uh, figure. And it's not always higher. So that I'm like, all right, I'm not going to mention that. But in Lackawanna County, it is. I mean, we have some very, very rural areas. Uh, everybody is familiar. And I actually say this up here where Sullivan County is. It's very close. I use that as the example of a very rural county. Um, they have one traffic light in the entire county. I made the mistake last year of announcing the fact that they got a second traffic light, and I was corrected. I was told that they were working on a bridge, and that's why they had it up. It was just a temporary one. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I can't use that statistic anymore. So um, that's what all over the state, and it's funny here that I can mention Sullivan County and you all know where it is. In other parts, they're like, I have no idea where that is. I'm like, it's up near the Poconos. So, um, so one of the other things that they do is the Governor's Awards. Are you guys familiar with the Governor's Awards? Maybe some of you might have attended. Uh, this is a photo with, of me with uh, Mira Nakashima, uh, who was, as a woodworker, one of the uh, moments of my life. Um, I didn't geek out as much as Cole did. Cole could barely speak in front of her. <laughs> but um, it was a great moment to meet her. I mean, to meet everybody, but especially her. And I got assigned to her, so I got to hang out with her the whole day. Um, which, yeah, I got over my geeking out moment very quickly. Um, but that was phenomenal. To celebrate the arts around the state, to bring that to, um, it used to always be in Harrisburg, and then we started moving it around the state. And that has done, brought so much more energy for the arts um, to the Commonwealth. So that's one of the things that we do. Uh, we also do Poetry Out Loud. How many people are familiar with Poetry Out Loud? Poetry Out Loud is a poetry um, um, reciting competition. Uh, it, is, uh, it was started through the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, we do it in, I don't, I don't, I'm pretty sure every state does uh, participate in it. Um, we have had phenomenal uh, young um, high school students uh, participate. Um, but we have not, we have not yet a won a national one yet, so we've gotten close. Uh, we also have Preserving Diverse Cultures Division. Um, this supports the creation, development um, of organization programs and projects uh, of diverse cultures, uh, African American, Latino, Asian, Asian American, Native American, and Hispanic uh, through their uh, perspectives. The applicants' uh, programs and staff um, actually are in a program where we give them additional support, additional training, additional um, help to have them build up their programs, to build up their organizations. Um, we have a wonderful person on staff, Dana Payne, who uh, oversees that, um, very hardworking, um, travels the entire Commonwealth uh, on a regular basis. Um, we're very lucky to have her. Um, if anything that you have questions about, I will do my best to answer it at the end. If not, I will more than likely be directing you to the staff member um, who can answer it better. Uh, we also have the Folk Arts uh, PA, 
which Dana also oversees. That program uh, sustains folk and traditional arts across the Commonwealth uh, through services to the fields. Uh, they have a statewide folk arts apprenticeship program uh, and an infrastructure partnership. Uh, it's a system of seven independent uh, regional organizations that work to um, promote the traditional arts. Um, here's a map of the different regions. You'll actually see Lackawanna is not shaded. We are currently looking for, um, uh, we're doing research to find organizations that can help in our gray areas where we're not fully covered. Um, they are kind of overseen by Dana from the office. Um, but, and I'll, I'll mention it when we get to our strategic plan, that traditional arts was very important uh, for this region. They actually mentioned it. Nobody's gonna fall on me, right? <laughs> Also, our arts and education partnerships. Uh, it enables the PCA to work with and through regional uh, service organizations uh, to provide a higher level of quality and uh, quantity of arts and education. Uh, they do teacher and artist partnerships, long-term residencies, and they also oversee our Poetry Out Loud uh, program. Uh, for this area, um, AIE, uh, the uh, IU19 is the partner, Kat Cullen, which I was kind of hoping would be here this morning so I could... Uh, what's that? Oh, excellent. So if you have any questions, she'd be the one to ask because I would come up with an answer which would sound perfect and phenomenal and then you would talk to her and like, yeah, that's not how we do it. Um, Jamie Dunlap at, uh, on our staff is, is incredible. Um, she is incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. She's like my kid's sister I never wanted. Uh, we get along great. So um, you, can either, you can contact uh, the IU or contact our staff uh, for more information about that. Um, and they also do art sparks. Uh, they transform a public space. Uh, it's in, it's uh, working with the Turnpike Commission. So they uh, join together and they uh, create work. Um, it's a new program, uh, student-created murals that are placed in the Turnpike um, rest stations, rest areas. Um, it has been phenomenal. They've done a tremendous amount of work. This is a photo actually from just this June uh, in the King of Prussia Plaza. And then we get to the Pennsylvania Partners in the Arts. Uh, this is very important to me because this is the program that I oversee. Um, Pennsylvania Partners in the Arts, there are 13 partners, cover all 67 counties. Uh, we do re-granting to smaller organizations. Um, we have Tassie Gilbert here, if you want to wave. Tassie is the... Oh, applause. Oh, okay. Tassie is your uh, regional partner. So I want to talk briefly about funding in the arts on how it is done on a state level. So larger organizations that have budgets of over $200,000 um, or for arts programs, and that would be, uh, the reason I say arts programs is you can be a non-arts organization but have an arts programming. For example, the Everhart as a museum, they are a museum, but it's not all dealing with the arts. So their arts program is over $200,000, so they apply directly to the state for arts funding through our AOAP, which is Arts Organizations Arts Programs. Smaller organizations that have budgets under $200,000 apply through one of our regional regranting partners, which the Poconos Art Arts Council is the one for this region. They apply through um, Project Stream, which is smaller grants uh, for up to $2,500. Um, they are not, they're not um, guaranteed. Uh, you will, you're, it is very um, competitive. Uh, the panel meets every um, summer uh, to review. I recognize several people here who have served on the panel, and I want to thank you for that. Um, 
And then also there is a program stream, which is organizations that have been funded in Project Stream for a number of years. They have consistent high scores. They may be asked to transition, invited to transition from Project Stream to Program Stream. Program Stream is pretty much guaranteed funding from year to year. Um, the larger organizations that apply directly to the state go through the same type of process through entry track and then they can go into AOAP and it's pretty much guaranteed funding uh, for your organization. So um, I will be more than happy to answer questions about that at the end. So the Pennsylvania Partners in the Arts, uh, the goals of the PPA, they enable, uh, they expand the constituents reach. Uh, we in Harrisburg cannot obviously get to every part of the Commonwealth, although I do a very good job of that in August while I'm traveling. Um, and it gets to underserved communities. They are the people that are on the ground uh, in the communities. Um, and they are a very dedicated group to reach everyone, and they're always available for you. Tassie does a fantastic job, um, and she's always there to answer questions. She's always on the ball when I call and ask for information, which is very random sometimes, um, but she has it for me. Um, some of the people that help us do what we do, uh, Citizens for the Arts in Pennsylvania, is everybody familiar with Citizens for the Arts? Um, if not, please visit their website. Um, they are our arts advocacy uh, group. Uh, they communicate the value and the impact of the arts to the decision makers in the media, in government, uh, corporate, um, all sectors. And they also take a stand on the legislation um, and they assist us keeping us informed and uh, helping us get information out to uh, the state about what is happening with the National Endowment for the Arts as well as within our state. And also the Legislative Arts and Culture Caucus. I do want to thank uh, uh, Senator John Blake and um, Representative, you're going to help me with the name. Thank you. Um, they are on, they are from the county and they are on the caucus. If you have other legislators that you know that you work with, um, please let them know how important it is to be on the caucus. I think we still have uh, what the largest uh, legislative caucus in the legislature. Um, it's a bicameral, bipartisan caucus. They established it in uh, 2012. Uh, the purpose is to provide the caucus members with access to the latest research, um, education, and policy developments on the arts and culture. They have been extremely helpful to us uh, with keeping our support in the legislature, um, especially in this time nationwide of a lot of cuts to the arts. And also, um, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. So another quick story about when I came to the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. In my first two weeks of working at the PCA, I was told that we worked with NASA. And I thought that was incredible. <laughs> We do art in space. For two whole weeks, I thought that we worked with NASA. And then I found out that it was the National Assembly of Start, uh, State Art Agencies. I'll have to admit I was a little disappointed. But since then, I have worked with them. They are phenomenal. They are a resource to us as a state art agency. Um, they actually... Um, they're the professional association of 56 state and uh, jurisdictional arts agencies. They do a lot of help with us for research. They help with our strategic plan. Um, a lot of the data that I'll talk about in a few moments is also from them. Uh, Americans for the Arts, their mission is to build uh, recognition and support um, for the extraordinary and dynamic value of the arts uh, to lead, serve, and advance the diverse networks of organizations and individuals who cultivate the arts in America. Um, certain things I read right off of here just to make sure I get them right. Um, Americans for the Arts is uh, a great network to work with. Um, you can sign up for their bulletins. Uh, on their website. Uh, they keep us informed. They keep everybody informed about what is happening nationally in the arts. So I highly recommend them. Uh, and then, of course, the National Endowment for the Arts. 
Um, they were started in 1965. Uh, they help fund um, us. They, uh, they fund um, all the state arts agencies. They assist us a lot with our uh, admin costs as well, as well as regranting funds. So I'd like to talk about where we are now and just give you a little bit of information about um, the artists. So in Pennsylvania, there's about 71,000 artists that make up 1.12% of the total labor force in Pennsylvania, which is phenomenal. Um, also, according to the Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis, $23 billion is spent through the arts. Uh, and that is broadcasting, publishing, uh, cultural events. Um, that's 3.3% of the economy. Then when we look at just our economic um, prosperity reports that the Americans for the Arts do, it also tells us that 1.6 billion is spent on cultural events. That's not counting admission. That's not counting the actual ticket. That is counting the money that is spent in your communities by parking, going to dinner beforehand, paying a babysitter. So I just want to stress how important the arts are to our economy. I know it was mentioned earlier, but that is one of the things that we talk about constantly to let everybody know, especially your legislators, or legislators to let them know how important the arts are, not only to a livable community, but to the economy as well. Um, this is the not so happy numbers. It's not bad, but this shows um, per capita each state and how much money is given uh, through the state appropriations. So for Pennsylvania, it's 75 cents per person. Um, Minnesota is $7.04. That's great. Uh, this one does not include uh, the District of Columbia, which in our regional ones it is. They're at about $42 a person. A lot of money, small group. Um, so we're not at the, the bottom, but we have a long way to go. And that is something that you can talk to your legislators about. Um, regionally, um, District of Columbia, as I mentioned, is uh, very high. New York is very high as well. Uh, this will be available to anybody that uh, would like this information. Just shoot me an email, and I will send you the reports um, if you would like them. And then this is our region. So DC is at about $42. Uh, Delaware is about $350 a person. Uh, New York is $2.25. Uh, New Jersey, um, about $1.80 per person uh, is spent on the arts. And um, Virginia is below us. They're only at $0.41. Cents. And West Virginia is at $0.38 cents, uh, per capita. And I'd also like to talk about where we are going uh, statewide. So we have a new grant system. How many people apply to the state for state arts funding through your organizations? All right, so a lot of you are already familiar with the new, the new system. Um, there have been a few hiccups, but the nice thing is it is through our state. It's not a third party. So we, they are building that as we go. So with our new system, uh, in the past, it has taken you a few months to receive your funding. Now it'll take a few weeks. Uh, the nice thing before, um, does everybody remember printing out all the forms and then signing them in triplicate and then mailing them to us? Uh, we've eliminated all that. Uh, when we would receive the grant proposals before, we would actually take them we would process them. We would then send them to our um, council. They would review them, send them back to us. Then we would send them to our comptrollers. They would review them and send them back to us. And then we would send them to our, uh, the treasury to actually get paid. That is all done digitally now. So it's just clicks as we go through and review them. Um, it takes a lot less time. Um, and it's a lot easier to apply. We also have new leadership. Um, Carl Blischke, uh, who was 
in my position about 10 years ago when I was at the Berks Arts Council has now come back as our new executive director. Uh, we just have uh, new leadership on the council as well. Um, we just had, as I said, our planning retreat, strategic planning retreat this past week, um, and they are very, very, very engaged, um, which I was very happy to see as a staff person. But I do want to talk about the strategic plan uh, briefly and some findings that you may find interesting. Um, so for the new strategic plan, uh, supporting livable communities was at the top. Um, all the groups reported that community arts programs and events were the most important to supporting livable communities through the arts, especially in this region. Um, public awareness of the arts, uh, equitable access to the arts, and arts education opportunities um, rated as highly important for all the respondents. Um, this one I found as a no-brainer, but it turns out that serving rural populations was more important for respondents from non-metro areas. Let that sink in a moment. So Philadelphia and Pittsburgh did not find it very important to serve rural areas, but the people in the rural areas did. I just found that one interesting. Uh, and also, the Northeast region placed the largest importance on serving rural, and the Southeast region placed the least. And along with that, uh, Northeast indicated preserving traditional art forms was more important than the other regions of the state. And I also found that very interesting. Your region um, finds it very important that the traditional art forms, that the folk arts, um, has a place, and we should preserve that. So um, we will be meeting more in Scranton about that. Um, so look for that coming up in the future. Um, and I wanted to talk about our mission again, uh, just briefly. At our council retreat this past week, we talked about our mission. And I wanted to jump back to, to that. Um, so as I said, the mission of the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts uh, is to foster the excellence, diversity, and vitality of the arts in Pennsylvania, and to broaden the availability and appreciation of those arts throughout the state. Um, how many people, by a show of hands, can recite their mission statement? I won't make you do it. We got one. Excellent. Two. That's great. So, the other question I have is, are any of you spies? None of you are on secret missions. So what I want to tell you is, in the big takeaway and what we found in the arts is um, we all have these great missions and we don't, we don't tell anybody about them. Um, when I was back at Habitat for Humanity, one of our national, the Habitat International did this survey and uh, just checking the time here. So um, they did a survey, and the two things that I remember getting from that survey nationally is that um, 73, or no, it was 36% of the people that took the survey um, did not know who Habitat for Humanity was, or they did not know what we did. But 73% thought that we were doing a great job. <laughs> and that stuck in my head for like a week and I walked around muttering those statistics as the development director and our administrative assistant said, why do you keep, keep bringing up those statistics? And I said, well, you know, 63% did not know who we were, 73, you know, it was, uh, yeah, 36%, and then 73 did not, that thought we were doing a great job. She's like, why is that important? I go, there's a percentage of people out there that have no idea what we do, but they think we're doing a great job at doing it. And it comes down to our mission, and it comes down to talking about what you do. And one of the other things that we found out by doing our strategic plan and by looking at having the meetings in the region is there are people out there that do not know who the Pennsylvania, Council, Pennsylvania Council of the Arts is, they do not know that they have arts in their community. When you talk to them specifically about a program or a concert or what they did this weekend, 
they will tell you and they'll say, well, we went to the, you know, the art museum or we went to a museum or we went to this show. And I said, well, you're taking in the arts. Like, well, I guess so. But I'm not really an arts person. Well, it doesn't matter. The arts make our communities livable. It's what's important. It's what bring, it does not necessarily what brings people to a community, but it is what keeps people in the community. And we need to let, as a, as a organization, as a community, as a group, we need to let people know what you have to offer. And you guys do a wonderful job of that. That was highlighted at the Governor's Arts Awards. Um, but we need to get that out there, more out into the region. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much what I have. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the challenges in Pennsylvania for the arts for, and a lot of that is the, it's not so much the, the rural communities and the urban communities. Um, state arts funding, we are doing a lot with equity, uh, diversity, um, having the funds go, um, not directly by population, um, but we do look at that, uh, especially with the uh, Pennsylvania Partners in the Arts funding. It's actually distributed um, by population is how we determine our funding. Uh, bless you. Um, some of the things that we were looking at for the future is looking more at, and this, is, this all came out during our strategic meeting this past week. Um, so we're working on our strategic plan, so I don't know what ideas we'll be taking and being put into the strategic plan. But we're looking more at um, funding smaller organizations to a higher level, possibly. Um, and then that way, there's not so much it's, when we fund a smaller organization, it's giving more support um, to the rural areas um, where they need the funding more. In the larger communities in Philadelphia, Erie, and Pittsburgh, um, they have a lot of support structure already. It's a lot of the smaller organizations that, that struggle. Yes. Right now in, well in Pennsylvania, certainly, because they can um, apply for, there's a lot of funding that's available, it's not available to uh, corporate uh, entities. Uh, but we're looking at partnering more with uh, for-profit organizations. They have a lot to offer. Um, they have a lot of revenue streams that nonprofits, you know, do not have exposure to. Um, a lot of it, when you look at um, corporate giving, now, are you looking at like Live Nation or organizations that are for-profit arts organizations? Is that what your question is? Right. Right, it depends on how they're structured. Um, for organizations like that, uh, the funding that is available, a lot of it is when they go for their, a nonprofit that contacts a corporation for funding. I mean, we all know it mostly comes from marketing, is the budgets that it's pulled from. Um, so focusing more on um, who you're approaching uh, how you're approaching them, and also partnering with the organization, uh, a nonprofit organization, with a corporation to benefit not only their employees, but also with their arc, um, marketing um, prospects. Excellent. Thank you.
And it, it really hit home for me when you were talking about telling our story better and our mission. Um, one of the things our department's going to be looking at is that idea of advocacy and getting our what we do for our communities out there. Um, it's great to have Larry West here from uh, Senator Blake's office, who, as we mentioned, is very supportive. Um, Sid Kovalich usually comes here. Um, Tom Welby was devastated. He couldn't be here. I think he's came to everyone. He had a wedding, but he represents Marty Flynn's office. So we're lucky we have a lot of support here, but we can't take it for granted. And also just advocating to the public on why the arts is important. We're also thrilled to have our great partners from the Pocono Arts Council here. They're a great resource, Sue and Tassie. Um, to, uh, they're always a phone call away if you have questions about funding, and we always invite them to our grand ceremony, because even though we're a community, we really are a great arts region. So I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy day, and please stay around and mingle. I know sometimes more work gets done after the presentation, so, and thank you so much, Matthew, for that wonderful presentation. Have a great day.